Joe's Bell Bottoms and Super Sugar Crisp. We watched the Mickey Mouse Club and Soupy Sales in the afternoons. We waited for the dough to rise in our Easy Bake Ovens and we battled with our Rock'em Sock'em Robots. And when we weren't skimming through the, the latest edition of Mad Magazine, we were reading about Bob Seeger in Rolling Stone. Now, besides covering the memories of growing up in Dearborn, the book goes into great depth of the shows, the music, the styles, the culture that we baby boomers experienced. And it outlines both the contributions afforded by boomers and the general misnomers about us. And there are quite a few. After all, we were the first to grow up with television and fast food. We lived to the golden age of toys and candy, the silver age of comic books, and we were the first to ride our Schwinn Stingray bikes. And while coming of age as a baby boomer was a magical experience in itself, growing up in Dearborn during that time made it even more enchanted. This is what this presentation will cover. Now serving as the home of Ford Motor, the city of Dearborn had a substantial tax base to draw from. And this allowed Mayor Hubbard and the city council to provide us the facilities and, and services unheard of in other communities. And added to that were the world famous tourist attractions right in our own backyard, Henry Ford Museum, Greenfield Village, and the Ford Rotunda. So if you're ready to travel back in time, let's climb into our Wayback Machine with Mr. Peabody and Sherman, some of you may know what I'm talking about, and let's set a course for the dear largest building in Ford country, the Ford World Headquarters, also known as the Glass House. This is really the pinnacle landmark of Deer. Construction started in September of 1953 and the building was dedicated three years later. Now, prior to the glass house, Ford Central Staff was located in a large complex built in 1928 on the southeast corner of Schaefer Road and Rotunda Drive and directly across Schaefer Road from the old office uh, was the Ford Rotunda. At one point, the Rotunda was the fifth most popular attraction for the World's Fair in Chicago in 1933. And afterwards, it was dismantled and rebuilt in Dearborn as a welcoming center for Ford Motor. In 1953, the Rotunda's annual Christmas fantasy was held for the first time and nearly half a million people visited. The displays included an elaborate Santa's workshop, a life-size nativity scene, and animated characters in the children's stories. The Christmas fantasy was held for nine consecutive years at the Rotunda, and I'm certain many of you have fond memories of visiting with your family. Unfortunately, on November 9th, 1962, a fire broke out on the roof as workers were waterproofing the building, and despite efforts from the Dearborn Fire Department, the walls of the rotunda collapsed within an hour. Fortunately, no one was killed. Now, of course, we can't discuss Dearborn without at least one slide of Greenville Village and Henry Ford Museum. We're not gonna get into the history, the background, just not enough time. But like many of you, I recall class trips and attending special events on the weekends with the family, the old car festival, the Muzzle Loaders Festival, special Christmas event. Boulevard, where the Ford Test Track is now. The original structure of the inn was completed 90 years ago, and it was the nation's first hotel to have air conditioning. Now, how many of you enjoyed a nice dinner, attended a graduation party, or even a wedding reception here at the inn? 
We now take our way back machine to the steps of the old city hall complex in Michigan and Schaefer. Now, we are not going to get into the politics of Dearborn, the former Mayor Hubbard and city council. That could be a presentation on its own. And as kids growing up back then, we really weren't interested in politics, right? But we did appreciate the recreational facilities by the Dearborn's municipal leaders. For instance, the old Dearborn Youth Center, located on the south side of Michigan, west of Greenfield, this 40,000 square foot facility officially opened in November of 1959. It was strategically located between East and West Dearborn so that kids and families of all areas of the city could enjoy its wide variety of activities. The large dome room was perfect for conferences, banquets, exhibits, not to mention dancing and roller skating. The initial youth center had a snack bar, 16 conference rooms, and a large games area. How many great memories did you make over the years with friends and family there? And really, recreation was a big part of growing up in Dearborn. There were no less than 25 city parks throughout the decades, not to mention acres of woods and the areas to explore around the Rouge River. Of course, Ford Field, Crowley Park, Levergood Park, these were among the largest. And of course, Levergood featured the seashore pool. The seashore was dedicated in 1942, originally boasted of a sandy beach and an Olympic-sized swimming area. It was a popular place to spend summers, and back in July in 1959, the park had a record attendance of 15,000 people during one weekend alone. The Sandy Beach was eventually replaced, and in 1976, the city added an enhanced pool complex and renovated bathhouse. And the Ford, Word, uh, Ford Woods Park and Ice Arena at Ford and Reedfield is another great example. The land was virtually a wilderness before the city crews began working on it in August of 1941. And within just 18 hours, the first playground section of the park was ready for use. Associated with the park is the Dearborn Ice Skating Center, which was formerly known as the Mike Adre Arena. It was built in 1971 and a second rink was added in 96. And of course, the ultimate summer destination for kids in Dearborn and their families was Camp Dearborn, which opened Memorial Day 1948, 73 years ago this month. This photo is from July of 1969. Camp Dearborn was Mayor Hubbard's pet project and he called it the Citizens Country Club. Of course, it's located in Milford. It covers 626 acres of ponds, lakes, and access to the Huron River, not to mention a half mile beach, swimming pool, picnic sites, and camping. Now, besides top recreational facilities, Dearborn also continues to offer a first rate library system. And it started with the Bryant Branch Library, previously known as Mason Branch, which opened in 1924. And it remained the main library until Henry Ford Centennial opened in 1969. Next came the City Branch Library, opened in 1930 on the second floor of the City Hall. And it then moved to various locations in the coming years. It eventually closed in 69 when Henry Ford Centennial made it no longer necessary. The Southeast Branch was a small facility located on Salinas Street off of Miller. It opened in 1941, but it was changed to a reading room back in June of 72. The Esper Branch on Warren Avenue, dedicated in October of 1953, and it was originally named the Warren Branch. No surprise there. And of course, one of my favorites, the Snow Branch Library on Telegra Telegraph and Princeton. Uh, this opened in January 1960, and began with a collection of 6,500 books, but it was a small, but it was a sufficient facility at 12,000 square feet. And unfortunately it closed in September of 2011. Then came Henry Ford Centennial Library. 
When this facility opened in November 1969, I was 11 years old and we kids thought it was the coolest place. You could not help but be impressed by its size and grandeur. The library's original floor plan included large meeting rooms on the first floor, a large children's section, open stacks for magazines, listening booths to play record albums. How many of you remember that? And a number of electric typewriters that were spread along the second floor. Now, utilizing Dearborn's great libraries was important to us kids and teens who were attending the schools, new, uh, the city's numerous schools, whether it was public or parochial. And no matter what high school you graduated from, be it Dearborn High, which is uh, up there left, Fortson High, Etzel Ford, Sacred Heart High, on the lower left, San Alphonsus or Divine Child, some of us continued our education in Ford country either at the University of Michigan Dearborn campus, which opened in 1959, or at Henry Ford Community College, which was originally named Fortune Junior College back in 1938 when this opened. It adopted the name of Henry Ford Community in 1952. Now the current campus at Evergreen and Ford Road was completed and dedicated 10 years later in 1962. I first attended Henry Ford in February of 1977, and I wonder how many of you I passed by in the hallways, in the classrooms, in the student center. Now the same year HFCC campus opened in 62, St. Joseph's Retreat was closed down after operating for the last 20, 80 years. And for those of us too young to remember, St. Joseph's Retreat was a towering massive Gothic facility that sat back on the northeast corner of Michigan and Outer Drive. And if its Munster-like exterior didn't send shivers through you as a kid, with all to respect, the facility's purpose most certainly did. St. Joseph's was Michigan's first private mental institution, which opened in 1882. It subsequently catered mostly to the affluent, and incidentally, the very first telephone ever installed in the city of Dearborn was at the retreat in 1889. Now here's an old photo prior to 62, looking towards the Southeast and directly across Michigan Avenue from St. Joseph's, per the and she, St. Joseph's with the yellow arrow, is Retreat Field. Retreat Field is shown in the red triangle. Retreat Field stretched across the south side of Michigan from Outer Drive to, to Nolan, and the field was eventually sold to a developer. Now this red tank triangle, ladies and gentlemen, is the future site of Westbourne Shopping Center, which opened in February of 1959, and we're gonna get to Westbourne in a few minutes. A few more historic landmarks we passed by a thousand times growing up in Dearborn, the Commandant's Quarters, corner of Michigan Monroe, part of the Dearborn Historical Museum. This was built in early 1830s and remains the oldest building in Dearborn, still on its original site. Kitty Corner from the Commandant's Quarters is the Wagner Hotel Complex. In this photo from 1956, it was built in 1896 uh, constructed from bricks in the Wagner Brickyard. It closed in the 1920s and it was used for very bu various businesses, including a Dearborn post office and, of course, a branch of Cunningham Drugs, as shown here. Four blocks west of the Wagner complex is another landmark that stood for 50 years in Dearborn. How many remember the Mercury Motor Inn and its coffee shop? The Mercury opened in February of 1960 with its unforgettable neon retro sign. And the, uh, the, the coffee shop featured a great breakfast, other daily specials served from its center counter area that was surrounded by bar stools and small tables. Now I have to admit that I almost cried when I saw the Mercury torn down. And I don't know about you, but a big part of my childhood went with it. And almost as familiar as a landmark as the Mercury signage on Michigan Avenue 
were these 30 foot tall structures on Telegraph Road. How many of you remember the Presta Whip cans? These were built in the late 1960s, just south of Michigan Avenue. It's interesting that they not only served as advertising for White House products, but they were in fact functioning silos. They stored soy, soybean oil and sugar for production at the facility. They were torn down in 1983 when Presto Whip was sold, but boy, sure bring, sure bring back some great memories. All right, so let's redirect our Wayback Machine and let's focus on the popular retail offered in Dearborn with more attention on local versus national retailers. Located in East Dearborn, the Safe Schaefer Building was one of the first complexes to offer offices and retail space. This was built 91 years ago. Three-story Art Deco monster that takes up an entire city block. When it opened, it was the largest commercial building on Michigan Avenue between Detroit and Chicago. Now, of course, some of the businesses we remember that occupied Schaefer Building included the Bank of Dearborn, Flaming Steaks Restaurant, and SS Kresge's shown here, which took up most of the interior square footage. Still lacking major shopping center in West Dearborn in the late 1950s. Again, we discussed that a developer had purchased Retreat Field and announced plans for new retail with construction beginning in August of 1957. And of course, we're talking about Westbourne Shopping Center. Westbourne's grand opening was on February 26, 1959 with Kroger's on the far east end and Crowley's on the far west and in between the original stores from 1959 are listed here in no particular order. Of course, there were other places like Alexander Pullen Market, Rolls Jewelers, Bank of Dearborn, and Hong Kong Restaurant that would open years later. But I bet we could spend an entire hour just talking about Westbourne. Crowley's was a trial level department store, 200 seat auditorium on its top floor, for meetings and fashion shows. And there was a middle escalator that took you downstairs for other items, including luggage and a small records department. Now for us kids and us teens in the area, this was the store to go to for Mother's Day, Father's Day and Christmas. And like many of you, I really miss Crowley's. Now both Kresge's and Sanders had three main locations in Dearborn at one time. And the ones in Westbourne had their own lunch counters with specialty items, sandwiches, soups, and cream puffs, just to name a few. And if you recall, the Westbourne Kresge's lunch counter, which is actually shown here, ran along the left side of the store as you walked in. The most important to us kids, their toy department was in the very back and to the right next to the pet department that featured the little green turtles and goldfish for sale. Westbourne was changed to an enclosed mall in the fall of 74, and Sally's was the last of the original stores to close in Dearborn, in, in Westbourne, I should say, which was really not that long ago. Now, 17 years after Westbourne opened, a new type of indoor mall was introduced to us in March of 1976, and it was called Fairlane Town Center. Again, we could take the entire hour just talking about Fairlane. Because when it opened on March 1st of 76, J.C. Penney was on its North Anchor department store, Sears was to the south, and Hudson's was on its northeast side. Lord & Taylor was also added in March of 1978. Now, how many of you remember the first time you walked into Fairlane in those early days? The large tiled flooring the wood trim glass railings, the ceilings, the hexagon shaped skylights, the central water feature. And how many of you spent time at the ice skating rink on the ground floor or saw Star Wars back in 1977 for the first time in one of their five movie screens, which was on the second floor over the skating rink. The ice rink eventually closed in November of 83 and is replaced with another five screen movie theater, but for those of us in those early days, an entire day of shopping, entertainment, eating, and people watching 
could be planned and spent at Fairlane. Now there are way too many stores to mention that were open one time or another in Fairlane. I'm sure you can recall all your favorites, whether they were national retailers or local, but we will mention a couple of the early eateries that were located inside, like the Tollgate, that's in the upper left corner, the Magic Pan, and Jonathan B. Pub, or even those located outside the parking lot, like Chuck Muir's Big Fish Restaurant and Kyoto's Japanese Steakhouse. And how many times did you ride the old monorail cars that shuttled us back and forth between Fairlane and the incredible Dearborn Hyatt Regency that opened just two months earlier? The shuttle could be picked up at Fairlane's mid-level near, near Hudson's, and this resulted in a 91 second automated ride traveling about 20, 25 miles an hour. The shuttle was subsequently shut down in 1987. And yes, the Hyatt Regency itself spread a whole new meaning, elegance and innovation to Ford country and it's from its curved facade to the open and towering interior to the effortless gliding elevators. And during that first week it was open, the hotel was visited by 20 thousand people a day. I was one of them. Back then there were three restaurants inside the Hyatt. Casual eatery called Cafe's Place on the second level as you get off the shuttle. A higher end restaurant down the hall called La Rotisserie and sitting on top of the Hyatt was a round revolving restaurant called the Rotunda that rotated once every hour. Dinner, drinks, music were featured nightly with great views of Dearborn stretched out before you. But even without the Schaefer Building, Westbourne Mall, Fairlane Town Center, Dearborn was not without a lack of retail. Not only department stores, but local businesses, clothing, music, home goods, and recreation. In East Dearborn, you had the national retailers like Montgomery Ward and Federals. They were kitty corner from each other at Michigan and Schaefer. You also had a slew of national retailers like Winkleman's, Albert's, and Baker's Shoes. On the way from East to West Dearborn, you would pass Hudson's Budget Store, which was on the Southeast corner of Michigan and Greenfield, which opened in 1963. Years later, it was replaced with a Kmart. And traveling further westbound on Michigan Avenue past Telegraph, you could shop at Spartan Department Store, which was not so much different than Kmart. And of course, the two most popular department stores in the past in West Dearborn were Muirheads and Jacobsons. Now in the 1940s, Apex Auto Service and Gas Station was on the very northeast corner of Michigan and military. It was owned by a gentleman by the name of John Muirhead. John married Alberta Albertson in 1946, who then created Muirhead's Children's Store, located just to the east of Apex. The store initially carried children's furniture, carriages, toys, and a large collection of dolls. Now this photo, taken in the early 1960s when Apex became a Speedway gas station, you can see it there in the corner, the far right. You can also see Sacred Heart Church and the Mercury Motor Room. Now John Muir had eventually closed the station, tore it down so that Muirhead's department store could be expanded all the way to military. And here is a photo of Alberta Muirhead years later standing proudly in front of the expanded store. Now the Muirheads themselves lived on the second floor of the building. Back in the early days, many of you recall visiting Muirheads at Christmas time so you could take Santa's igloo by means of a sleigh ride on rails. And from there, you could have your photo taken with the big guy. What a thrill that was. Now, since the 1940s, Diggly Brothers Furniture was also a longtime retailer in Dearborn. They're on the south side of Michigan between Tenney and Howard Street. Now, they eventually closed, and the property was taken over by yet another iconic department store called Jacobson's. The open house for Jacobson's took place on October 6, 1964. They focused on apparel, fine jewelry, and quality home furnishings. 
and many a Dearborn bride purchased their wedding dress at Jacobson's, not to mention fine china and silverware. The restaurant located on the second floor, and I remember the name, was called Top of the Fountain. That featured the famous Waldorf salad and cheese soup. Another popular furniture store in Dearborn was the Europe Company on the north side of Michigan between Military and Howard. They were known for their clocks, their furnishings, and their home accessories. And in 1962, Eurex added a general store and an ice cream parlor, complete with an old fashioned soda fountain and a large penny candy selection, Tootsie Rolls, candy dots, knuckle wafers, pixie sticks, and taffy. How many memories does this bring back to you? What a treat it was to go to Eurex as a kid and buy the candy and the ice cream, walk around at stores. So sad when that place closed. The ice cream parlor in the back of Eurex included a service area with a large uh, dark maple top, rich wood counter, Tiffany overhead lights. All of this dated back to the 1870s. The furniture was actually purchased in Massachusetts and was brought to Dearborn when the parlor opened. Again, there are far too many local clothing and accessory stores of the past to mention them all, but you will recall shopping at stores on Michigan Avenue like Price's Menswear, Ted's of Dearborn, King's Boot Shop, Maternity Mode, and Mary Jane's Bridles. Not to mention Sims Boys and Menswear, Stewart's Ladies Apparel. You remember Don's Department Store, Telegraph in Oxford. And Mano Clothing, further down Michigan, which is still open, by the way, just east of, uh, east of Telegraph. And of course, who can forget Lynch's Costume Shop on Howard Street. This first opened in 1949 offering costumes, stage makeup, and Halloween accessories. Dearborn also boasted of its retail stores, specialty stores. For instance, on Telegraph, the very south end of Dearborn, there was a longstanding Jan, Jan's Tropical Fish. And at the north end of Telegraph, at Dearborn's northern border, Harry's Army Surplus, which is also still open. And Jack's Bicycle Shop. You may not know that Jack's was established in Dearborn way back in 1935 on Mason Street, later moving to its current location on Michigan, west of Telegraph. Retailers located in the Kelvin Theater Block, Cameo Gowns, Little Professor Book Center, Little uh, the Silver Bear Gift Shop, and of course, let's not forget Miss Goes Bar, previously the Aviation Cafe. Local appliance stores included Radio Franks in East Dearborn, Walter's Home Appliance on Michigan, east of Oakwood, and the ever popular Adrae's Appliance at Carlisle and Outer Drive, the sponsor of countless sport, uh, local sports teams. But Dearborn also had its share of music and record stores. Of course, the most popular and most remembered is Dearborn Music corner of Michigan Monroe, and still open on Michigan Avenue, just with the military. How many of you purchased your first Beatles albums, your first Motown album? Now, if you get on Dearborn's music website, it says that they've been open since 1956, but historic city directory show Dearborn music as far back as 1943, <coughs> excuse me, on Michigan Avenue between military and Howard. In East Dearborn during the 1970s and 80s, Peaches Records and Tapes, that was the place to go on Schaefer Road just north of Michigan. But my first, uh, the, the Fleetwood Mac Rumors album there in 1977. Peaches was probably the largest record and tape store within city limits and even larger than Music Land at Fairlane. Now, of course, if you weren't listening to the latest songs in your eight track player, you could always tune into WKNR. Keener 13 started playing top 40 music on Halloween in 1963. The reason we bring up WKNR is because the station was located in Dearborn, south side of Michigan, east of Greenfield, next to the Lamplighter restaurant. 
And of course, if you prefer to simply play the music yourself, you could always go to Grinnell's of Dearborn, Anderson Music on Telegraph, or Wonderland Music on Michigan, east of Schaefer Road, selling various musical instruments, sheet music, and lessons. Now, Ford Country has also had its share of long-standing party stores, including Bill's at Michigan and Hay. And if you were too lazy to get out of your car for a six pack, there is always Pat's driving on Telegraph, south of Ford Road. Just drive through the middle of the building, roll your window down, place your order, hand them your money and your fake ID, and head out to Ford Field or Heinz Drive with your drink buddies. And after a late night of drinking, Dearborn was blessed with a number of slider joints in every corner of the city. Carter's Hamburgers had several locations at one time. Uh, South Telegraph at, at Notre Dame, on the northeast corner of Ford and Schaefer, which is lower right-hand corner photo, and on Outer Drive at Southfield, which is still there. In fact, Carter's has been a main fixture in Dearborn since 1948. There is also the famous Powers Hamburger. There's one in Michigan and Oakwood, and there's another one on the far east end of Dearborn and Michigan and Wyoming back in the 40s and the 50s. White Tower Hamburgers opened in 1954 on Michigan Avenue, east of Schaefer. And decades later, it became Tammy's Cafe, eventually closing just a few years ago in 2017. And not sure how many of you are gonna remember the Sip and Nip Drive-In, located on Telegraph Road, just two blocks north of Cherry Hill from the 1940s and the 1950s. How many of you pulled in here in your 57 Chevy? And of course, we can't forget the fabulous pizza in our Dearborn neighborhoods, including the local bakeries who served slices and pizza rolls. Again, too many to mention them all, but here's a few. Amato's Pizzeria, since the 1940s, there were two locations. Not sure if they were related. And of course, Angelo's Pizzeria, by far the most popular, most remembered in West Dearborn. Enter from the back, walk through the kitchen to your table. I could not find a photo of Angelo's, and boy, I would love to have one. Capri Italian Bakery opened in 1973, known for the pepperoni rolls. The Cibo House Pizzeria, home of the Little Cibo. Como's Pizzeria in East Dearborn, and on Dino's on Monroe Street, just south of Carlisle, Dino's Pizzeria. Corbino's Pizza, Telegraph between Wilson and Hollander Street, a local favorite. And of course, the favorite Dearborn Italian Bakery. DIB has been a fixture in, in Dearborn since 1960. Carardi's Pizzeria and their old world Roman restaurant, they were both associated with the original Joseph's restaurant on Telegraph back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And of course, there's Liberty's Italian since 1957, originally on Miller Road, they're now located in Allen Park. Who remembers the great Roma Bakery on Schaefer between Ford Road and Warren? Large selection of pizza and baked goods. And last but not least, Roman Village opened in 1964, still serving great pizza and Italian on Dix Avenue, north of Werner Highway. Anyone getting hungry yet? Now beyond burgers and pizza, Dearborn was known for its great restaurants and diners, especially given the fact that Metro Detroit remains a, melting, a melting pot of culture and cuisine. Again, too many to name, and unfortunately, most of them are no longer with us. But do you remember Applegate's Prime Beef House, north side of Michigan, west of Schaefer, opened in 1957, known for its steaks and prime rib, but best known for the large black Angus steer mounted on the front exterior of the building. Who remembers Bajas? Northeast corner of Michigan, a telegraph opened in 1959, known as Michigan's finest dining and cocktail lounge. Uh, Bajas closed in 1970, was picked up by Chuck Muir, who turned it into a Sundog about 1972, and then followed by Son of Sundog about 78. It is now an empty lot. On the south side of Michigan, 
between Telegraph and Outer Drive where the yellow arrow is pointing. Blazos boasted of the country cousin, the best double-decker hamburger ever. They're also known for the car hop service in the back and their famous strawberry pies. This photo is from 1966, looking eastbound down Michigan Avenue. Now the orange arrow points at Baja's Lounge at the bottom. The green arrow points at Westbourne and the red arrow points at the Village Plaza. And if you notice, it is presently under construction at the time. And speaking of the Village Plaza, the Bruin Kangaroo is located inside, offering light lunches, sandwiches, and drinks. And how many of you remember a tiny little jack-in-the-box on the same northwest corner of Michigan and Outer Drive in front of the Village Plaza back in the 1970s? Of course, we can't forget the famous Browns and Fish Chips, Browns Fish and Chips, east side of Greenfield, north of Hubbard Drive easily recognizable with its quirky box-like revolving sign out front, also known for the coconut cream, banana cream, apple, and cherry pies. And whoever took a date to the Chamberton restaurant, four-star dining. This was originally on Michigan near, near uh, Oakman, but moved to West Dearborn, east of Nolan Street, and inside the old Dearborn Holiday Inn complex shown here, in November of 1964, Chamberton offered fine continental cuisine, very elegant. And if you make a re or made a reservation, they would print your name in a matchbox and put, leave it on your table as a place setting. The old Chicago Roadhouse, east of Brady, a very trendy, popular restaurant in its day. They were known for the steaks, seafood, and other items cooked from their famous copper pit. Christoph's of Dearborn. They've been around for 40 years. 